Let's talk about statistical arbitrage. Number one, what does that even mean? Number two, what the heck is all this information even telling me? And number three, do I need some crazy deep understanding of quant finance just to navigate it all? Well, by the end of this very short video, all this will be answered and more, so you can save some of those precious ChatGPT tokens for other projects. Imagine the price of Cosmos versus Filecoin on a weighing scale, where the higher the price, the lighter the asset is. We might see that statistically these two assets' prices in relation to one another tend to hover around some kind of midpoint, which we'll call the mean, their average. If Cosmos drops heavily in price, we might say that it is undervalued in respect to Filecoin and vice versa. We care about the trading relationship between Cosmos and Filecoin by going long on one asset and maintaining market neutrality by shorting the other. To understand how one asset is performing against the other, we could try to subtract one from the other like this. Let's call this difference the spread between two assets. You can see for these two very similarly priced assets, when Y is low, our spread is negative. A negative spread suggests going long on Y, the dependent asset, and short on X, the independent asset. This should result in a profit if the pair's analyzed relationship reverts to its mean which is where we will close both sides of the trade. But this is easy to see and calculate when asset prices and movements in respect to one another are about the same, which we will never assume. What about when they're very different, like Cosmos and Filecoin? Well, in reality, instead of just subtracting one asset from the other, we subtract some ratio of one asset from the other. This ratio just resembles for every unit of movement in the price of X, how much does Y typically move by? This ratio is called the hedge ratio. So our calculation for the spread just becomes y minus our hedge ratio times x. Or in our case, the spread is equal to Filecoin minus some hedge ratio times Cosmos. Well, that is just one way to understand it. We call this the static spread because the hedge ratio doesn't vary over time. A dynamic spread does. There is a short video on that here. Finally, we also have the ornstein uhlenbeck or OU spread which you can think of as a much fancier calculation of a static spread, with a lot more information that comes out of it. We will cover that another time. A pairs trader will use the spread to make trading decisions. If they see that the pair has a strong relationship, that the spread follows with a seemingly predictable movement zigzagging up and down, they look for where the spread statistically deviates from this, moving far to the downside or far to the upside. However, when comparing different spreads with different assets, we like to measure the distance from the mean using the same scales. So every spread is just normalized to show an average of zero and standard deviation of one. This is in fact known as a Z-score. Funnily enough, the name of the crypto wizard's tool, but to avoid confusion with what's known as the rolling Z-score, which we'll touch on shortly, we just call it the spread, even though it's a normalized or Z-score spread. The spread should reside within two standard deviations of either side of the mean roughly 95% of the time and three standard deviations roughly 99% of the time. So a deviation of say negative 2.1 might signal an opportunity to go long on the spread for a trader looking to capitalize. By the way, you can see this negative 2.1 as being called the Z-score norm here. Norm meaning normalized. Sometimes traders trade the more nuanced micro movements within the spread itself and compute a z-score based on a rolling window shown here as 0.37 as the latest value. We have covered such a calculation in many courses should you ever need it. How do we know that the spread has a satisfactory zigzagging of ups and downs around a mean? We run a statistical test known as co-integration. If just one time series zigzags up and down, we say it is stationary or integrated of order zero to be specific. But a price series is almost never stationary. However, if there is some linear relationship like the static spread we modeled earlier, and that ends up being stationary, we call this being co-integrated or co-integration. To test for co-integration, we use the Engel-Granger test. This just runs the pre-calculated spread, be it it's static or whatever, through a well-known statistical test and returns a result. Co-integrated, yes or no. That's what you see here. There is another test which we have for co-integration known as the Johansson test. This is just a much more computationally intensive calculation which relies on much deeper mathematical properties of the prices between the assets being tested. You might say, well, if the spread zigzags up and down a lot, shouldn't it cross the zero mark often? Also, 
If I want to go long or short on the pair at, say, negative two and positive two standard deviations, shouldn't I look for spreads that have crossed those boundaries often? Sure. In this example, you can see that the spread crossed the zero standard deviation this many times and the two standard deviations this many times. Here's what that spread looks like. Yet another useful metric is the Hurst exponent. A low Hurst under 0.5 can signal a very strong mean reversion. However, we don't usually see such a strong score. So one might typically accept something under, I don't know, 0.9. What about if the spread is very far from the mean, say two standard deviations? How long does it generally take for it to revert back? Actually, let us introduce another very useful metric here known as half-life. Assume we are analyzing daily data. Then say we have a half-life of something like this. That means it takes this amount of days on average for the spread to revert halfway back to its mean. A lower half-life then means a faster reversion to the mean. Could we also seek evidence of an asset moving proportionately to its past prices, the other assets' past prices, and or even the past values of the spread. Assuming our two assets are shown to be co-integrated, we can run what is known as an ECM or an error correction model. This just compares the past values of both the assets in addition to the spread and checks whether proportions of those past values help to explain the current movements in our dependent variable Y. For example, notice here that overall, when y is placed as the dependent variable in our asset calculation, that the spread one time step ago typically has a fairly strong impact on the current price movement of y. It's highlighted in green because its p-value is less than 5%. In fact, the p-value is almost zero, meaning the chances of this being a statistical fluke are near zero. We call the gamma or spread lags impact here the speed of adjustment. The higher the absolute number, the faster the reaction. A really high number would suggest a strong and fast mean reversion tendency, which also helps to answer our prior question. Also, when X is placed as the dependent variable, the prior price of Y also has a statistically significant impact on the price of X, also with a low p-value. We tend to gray anything without a low p-value out, as these could be considered unreliable. This chart shows you for x versus y how the lag of y in red reacts to itself over time in addition to reacting to x. Actually, if you click here, you can see the gamma, the speed of adjustment over time. But wait, what is this strange thing here, you say? Well, the impulse response just shows as of the current time step t, what would happen to the spread, which is the light blue line, and prices, darker blue and red lines, given all known information from the ECM and no more random market shocks or surprises. This shows that the spread in this case would start inclining significantly. What is this ECM strength then? Well, this is just the crypto wizards indicator between minus one and one to show how much the pair's movements are deviating from their pre-mentioned ECM modeling. If this number hovers around zero, then they are following the general relationship closely. If they diverge a lot up or down, well, then they're not. But what about the correlation or measuring the dependency between the two assets in general? Is there a way to tell if they typically follow one another in their movements? And if so, how do we capitalize on that? Well, yes, there are advanced methods for finding whether or not one asset and another move alike. And from this, whether there has been a statistical divergence that we can arbitrage. To do this, we use a tool known as a copula. A distinct advantage of modeling the assets relationship using a copula is that we can visibly see if they behave more alike during market downturns, upswings, or really any market conditions. A simple strategy is just to model the dependency on their prices. For example, look at this Gaussian copula. A Gaussian copula models dependency strengthening towards the downside and upside symmetrically. The red dot shows that X, our asset 1, is very high in respect to Y, asset 2. So a trader might look to go long on Y and short on X. We can also see this by the percentages at the top, the probability of X being less than or equal to where it currently is, given the current price of Y, is 97.8%. Here we just show that as X bar Y to save space on the tool, but you get the point. 
You can also see on the chart that the prices are scaled between 0 and 1. X is near 0 0.8 and Y is near just 0 0.2, which doesn't happen very often at all. In fact, this snapshot resembles roughly three years of price data. Also note that we can measure dependency with correlation. If you just wanted to know how much do these asset prices typically move up and down like each other based on their returns, this section will tell you that. If you wanted to know how correlation changed over time, this chart will tell you that. In respect to dependency, there have been papers published to suggest that pairs trading stocks in the same industry may have an advantage. For cryptocurrencies, we don't know what industry they're in like we do with stocks, so we just look at similar mathematical properties to represent the same thing using unsupervised machine learning. That's what this profile check mark here shows. How do we even know if any of this can lead to profit? Well, we backtest the strategies and show the results. Here you can see what spread and strategy was used. And here you can see the backtest results. Oh yeah, of course. And you can see all the details of those over here. Well, then what about risk? Uh, how do I know whether one trade is more risky than another? The 91.2 and the 64.3% here show you the annualized volatility for the X and Y asset respectively. You can also see the volatility over time here and spot where clustering might happen. Volatility can help you decide how much of your capital to allocate to a given asset versus the other in order to hedge your risk. If you want to reduce risk, you could consider giving more capital apportionment to the less volatile asset. Value at risk, or VAR, says that we are 99% confident, based on just this one backtest, that we could stand to lose a max of 0.9% of our capital on this pair. And a 1.2% loss is our likely outcome if we were to blow through that. This expected worst case is known as the CVAR. But I hear you say that is just based on one backtest. Well, good point. Just click on the detailed analysis, see the VAR and CVAR run for 1,000 different simulations given the dependency behavior for a given asset pair. Finally, MDD is just the max drawdown. It measures the highest peak to the lowest trough of your equity from a backtest. Wow, this video has been longer than I thought, but I hope it clarifies much. If you want to know the actual math and logic behind this, check out this course here or YouTube series here. And of course, there's also a written guide here to help you explore. Until the next one, take care and talk soon.